It's almost 370 years since the first Putney debates. On the 25th of October, 1647, the moderate intelligencer, a, a news book, as it was called of the day, reported, a great assembly was this day at Putney Church when was debated matters of high concernment. What those matters of high concernment were, the moderate intelligencer did not say. We now know they were indeed matters of high concernment. The civil war was over, the king in captivity, parliament in disarray. The new model army was effectively in control and the levelers, a reforming political movement in today's parlance plainly populist, were gathering support. The constitution, based on a balance among king, peers and commons, was rendered inoperative. The weekly meeting of the General Council of the Army on the 28th of October, although, although not so intended, turned into a debate over fundamentals of the Constitution. It became a constitutional convention of a kind and importance not seen since. As the debates took their course, two competing notions of Constitution became plain. One was based on the old balanced Constitution with suitable adjustments in favour of the House of Commons and reduction of the King's powers. This was the constitution favouring the sanctity of property, class divisions, and rule by those who know best how to rule. The other notion of constitution envisaged a new constitutional order, one without king or peers, one based on the people, with wider suffrage, and a house of commons with restrictions on its powers and accountable to the people one in which even the common people, the mere breathers in Cromwell's phrase, would have their rights protected and some say in how they were to be governed. As the debates proceeded, the gulf between the two notions of constitution widened and became unbridgeable. The debates ended without agreement. Cromwell soon took control and the rest is history. With the restoration of the monarchy, the old balanced constitution was also restored, with some adjustments in favour of the House of Commons. From that constitution, our own is the direct descendant. Putney debates of 2017. We also have matters of high concernment to debate. Once again, the oldest and most central question of a constitutional order is brought into high relief. The place of the people and their relationship to the institutions of government. Our purpose is to place under scrutiny the fundamental principles and institutions of the present constitution. While our concerns are provoked by the referendum, our discussions will range more widely. We are not here to debate the rights or wrongs of quitting the European Union. I offer our debaters my warm thanks for taking part. Their predecessors in 1647 came from diverse backgrounds and were described at the time as the middling sort. Today's debaters are similarly diverse and may not object to being described as the middling sort. To the audience, I extend a warm welcome. The debates, I hope, will be informative and stimulating. I'll now move to introduce the first session. I'm not going to introduce our speakers. You can see their names displayed, and you also have, I hope, a program in which you can see their backgrounds. So Parliament and the People is the subject of this session, and I'm going to make a few minutes of introductory remarks. David Hume, the philosopher, historian, social theorist, writing in the 18th century observed, and I quote, nothing appears more surprising 
to those who consider human affairs with a philosophical eye than the easiness with which the many are governed by the few, and the implicit submission with which men, clearly women included, resign their own sentiments to those of their rulers. Hume went on to say, it's all the more curious when you consider that power, raw power, is always on the side of the governed. For, quote, the governors have nothing to sustain them but opinion. It is on opinion only that government is founded. That's the central question for a constitution, for constitutional authority. The relationship between rulers and ruled, between government and the people. Why do the people, what reasons do they have for restraining their natural liberty and accepting or acquiescing in a system of authority from which they are often excluded or with which they are often in disagreement? The system of authority we acquiesce in is the sovereignty of parliament, as the Supreme Court ruled a week ago. It means Parliament has the right to make or unmake any law, whatever. Parliament means the Queen in Parliament, but the House of Commons is the dominant branch. Parliamentary sovereignty means, in reality, the sovereignty of the House of Commons. Parliamentary sovereignty was established by parliamentarians in the 18th century, to whose fragmented ideas William Blackstone gave form and authority. The doctrine he formulated at that time remains, in essence, the doctrine we have today. The relationship between the people and Parliament has two enduring features. First, it is one of inherent tension. Secondly, it is one of dynamic, it is dynamic and changeable. Tension because of the artificial line drawn between what is for the people and what is for government. Dynamic and changeable because, because that line, being created and constructed, moves and changes according to opinion, and opinion moves and changes with the times according to the social, political, and economic context. I conclude with a couple of brief remarks of a more historical character. First of all, let us look a little more closely at the concept of parliamentary sovereignty. Parliamentary sovereignty is shorthand, an abbreviation for a rather more complex concept. Parliament represents the nation, the community, the people. Representative, not as agent or delegate, but as standing in the place of, embodying the represented, the people. Parliamentarians used to claim, when assembled, the whole people was assembled there in Parliament. In this sense, the sovereignty of Parliament is the sovereignty of the people. But notice, on this account, the real people, as opposed to this corporate, fictional sense of the people, the real people have no constitutional status or standing. The people make their voices heard in many ways, but only as allowed or tolerated by Parliament, not as a matter of constitutional entitlement. That, I think, is the origin of the doctrine. And finally, to what social problem, we might ask, was and still is parliamentary sovereignty the solution? The answer lies again in the affairs of the 18th century. Parliamentary sovereignty, in the sense I've just explained it, was a defense, a defense against the demands of the people, the real people, for a real place in the constitutional order. In other words, for more democracy, both direct and indirect, for more control over the affairs of government. To, sub to substitute for the fictional notion of sovereignty of the people through representatives, to sovereignty of the real people, the actual people. But why, we may ask, has parliamentary sovereignty and the fiction on which it is, which it is based, why has it survived? 
Well, I started with Hume, and so I end. The Humean answer is that the people will support the constitutional order and its fictions, provided the result is effective government. That is perhaps a wise insight into the workings of society. If government becomes ineffective, sectional, or self-serving, it risks losing the support of popular opinion. There is, however, another reason which I think Hume overlooked. Another current running through Western constitutional thought is the desire of the people, a desire inextinguishable, a desire to shape their own ends, to rule themselves, whatever that may mean. It may be we are now witnessing both dissatisfaction with government and a desire to have more involvement in it. The time may have come to redraw that line between the people and government, the time for a new vision, perhaps, of the Constitution. Thank you. We now move to our next speaker. Professor Shona Douglas Scott. Where's Shona? Right, Shona, over to you. This seems to be working. Okay, well, it's, it's always hard to go first, and that traffic light is very intimidating there, but I'll do my best. I'm going to talk about popular and parliamentary sovereignty and why neither is a complete solution to the quandaries Brexit poses for us. Popular sovereignty is the belief that a state's legitimacy derives from the will of its people, who are the source of all political power. This idea is found in French revolutionary discourse. Is it not working? Where do they turn on? Hmm? Where are the technicians? I didn't hear that. Okay, I'll speak right on top of it like that. Okay, try again. Start it over again, will you? Okay, so popular sovereignty is the belief that a state's legitimacy derives from the will of its people who are the source of all political power. This idea is found in French revolutionary discourse and it is we the people who ordain and establish the 1787 US Constitution, a reference invoked by Donald Trump when celebrating his inauguration as the day the people became the rulers of the nation again. Referendums are taken to be applications of popular sovereignty. Some argue that anything that frustrates the will of the people in a referendum... Oh. Yeah. yeah, that's right, I'm the guinea pig. We'll, we'll, we'll get there eventually. Some argue that anything that frustrates the will of the people in a referendum is anti-democratic. Who needs an act of parliament to trigger Article 50 when government has such a direct, powerful mandate? What could be wrong with this view? Well, I think quite a lot, actually. First, history tells us that this theory of democracy, i.e. the direct mandate from people to government, is often misused. In Latin America, plebiscites enabled tyrannical presidents to claim to embody the people's will over legislatures. And of course, Carl Schmitt, that crown jurist of the Third Reich, posited a direct link between the people's will and the Führer. That was democracy for him, as it was no doubt for Hitler and is today for other autocrats invoking the rule of the people. In any case, it's clear that popular sovereignty is not the basis. And I was talking, first of all, about history showing us that this theory of democracy through referendums can be misused. And then I'd mis moved on to talk about the fact that popular sovereignty um, is not the basis for the British Constitution, nor are referendums. Their use countrywide only stems from 1975, and the most important issues, such as the abolition of the death penalty or um, the legalization of homosexuality, did not involve referendums here. Rather, parliamentary sovereignty has been the bedrock of the British Constitution and UK politics based on representative democracy. 
1653, Oliver Cromwell's instrument of government declared legislative power resided in the Lord Protector and the people, but this didn't survive Cromwell. Even if we sometimes talk of sovereignty of the electorate, this only allows the people to choose a government. It doesn't ground the British constitution in the authority of the people. Maybe things should be different. Maybe we should embrace a written document said to derive its authority from the people. But would this mean that the June referendum Brexit result must be accepted as a mandate for government, even for a hard Brexit? I don't think so. Many constitutions, even those expressed to derive their legitimacy from the people, such as the American and German constitutions, do not provide for countrywide referendums at all. They also make it very difficult to amend their constitution. It's certainly not possible by a bare majority of those voting, as in the EU referendum. This is not to rule out referendums altogether, but to assert that the very idea of popular self-government must presuppose constitutional rules. There's no such thing as the objective general will of the people. It is amorphous in nature, and in any case, we need laws to enable and implement it. A referendum in a constitutional democracy is always a product of law. Legal powers are needed to establish it, and legal safeguards are needed to interpret its constitutional significance. However, should popular sovereignty be argued as germane to Brexit, Consider this, popular sovereignty is considered pertinent in Scotland, where it's claimed to date back to the 1300s in the Declaration of Arbroath. Might popular sovereignty form the basis of Scotland's own right to determine whether or not it exits the EU, given 62% of Scotland voted to remain? Surely it's the height of constitutional confusion if popular sovereignty is used to justify a leave vote in England where popular sovereignty is not part of the constitutional tradition, but ignored in Scotland where it is. Now to conclude, do these observations mean I am a keen enthusiast for parliamentary sovereignty? Does taking back control mean a situation where Westminster can do what it likes? No, I don't think so. But I do think the reasoning behind the key principle in the Supreme Court Miller case is compelling. Government can't change legislation, especially not people's rights, by executive fiat. Parliament must have its say. This is Constitutional Law 101, and authorities supporting it date back to the Civil War. But accepting that doesn't mean unbridled parliamentary sovereignty. Perhaps the antidote to that is constitutional principle which most countries have set in written constitutions to control major constitutional change. Without a codified or more substantive constitution, the UK lacks any such principles, and taking back control may lead to its very opposite. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very much. We now move to Professor David Runciman of Cambridge. Okay, thank you. Is this working? Yep. Um, I want to make a more specific case, which is about the electoral system, that is first past the post, and suggest that it's one of the biggest problems that we face at the moment in Britain. To be clear, I'm not going to make a case on the grounds of fairness. Other people might want to do that. I think the, the issues there are complicated. It's not at all clear to me which is the fairest system. I think there's a problem that the issue of fairness is often raised by the losers under the current system, and that makes it sound like special pleading. And if we are going to talk about fairness, there are probably more important kinds of unfairness than electoral unfairness. I think economic questions probably trump political ones. So my argument is not that it's unfair. My argument is that it's really dangerous. Um, and I think it's dangerous because I think in the current political climate, it produces a kind of reckless, high-risk to use a 17th century word, cavalier kind of politics. And I think the reason it does that is because it's designed to produce decisive artificial majorities. That's the point of first past the post. It doesn't represent majority opinion. It creates artificial majorities where there is no majority opinion. And then it corrals divided public opinion into the space of the artificial majority. And I just think our politics is too divided, too fractious, too partisan. 
I think we're divided across too many dimensions, not just by party. If it was just by party, this would probably work. But it's by education, it's by geography, it's by age. I think the most obvious example of the danger of winner-take-all systems is currently in the United States. Um, I think the artificial majority that is uh, allowing Donald Trump to exercise the power he currently exercises, it's not a real majority, it's an artificial one, shows just how reckless it is. And I'm aware that maybe in a world of Trump and Brexit, it could be argued that there are more important things than tinkering around with the electoral system. But I would put it the other way around. I think we're in the world of Trump and Brexit because of winner-take-all electoral systems. And the immediate cause for the election of Donald Trump is the American electoral system. There are other causes too, of course, but you do not get Trump as president without that very quirky system. I would also say, actually, that you don't get Brexit without first past the post, not because I think that the result of the referendum would have been different, but because I think there wouldn't have been a referendum if we'd had proportional representation. Now, if you think the referendum was a good thing, you'll think that's an argument against it. But I think that coalition government was very unlikely to produce what I take to be a very reckless form of politics. I do not think that PR is some kind of panacea. I am fully aware that across Europe, where they have different electoral systems, there are equal challenges of populist politics, of dissatisfaction with democracy. Democracy is under threat in many, many places. And over this year, we're going to see a series of elections in Europe, which will be an interesting test of rival electoral systems, including in France. But I don't think it's a coincidence that this kind of, I think, reckless populism has been let off the leash in the two winner-takes-all systems, which is Britain and the United States. And I think it has the potential to get worse. So let me just give very briefly two examples, one of which is a different way of looking at the question we just heard about, which is Scotland. Um, the Scottish devolution system is not a... Uh, winner take all first past the post system, but Scottish representation in Westminster still is, and it's frankly absurd. The SNP have all bar three of the representatives in Parliament, and yet more than a third of Scots voted to leave the European Union. I mean, we spent a lot of time talking about how Scotland is being corralled by the rest of the UK, but what about the Scots who wanted to leave? Who's representing them in Parliament? You could say it's unfair. I'm not interested in that. I think it's unstable. I also think that first past the post is killing the Labour Party. And again, you might think that's great if you don't like the Labour Party. And you might also think the Labour Party is doing a pretty good job of killing itself. But I still think that the Labour Party would not be in the mess it's in under a different electoral system. We would have different parties. And at the moment, British democracy lacks effective opposition. I mean, there isn't actually a real opposition to the current government in Parliament at the moment partly because we do not have an alternative government in waiting, which first past the post is meant to produce. What we see is that the divisions within Labour and across the electorate cannot be corralled into this highly artificial system. I don't know what a better system would be. I can think of quite a few. I don't know how we would get there. But if you think it's a real problem to have a parliamentary system without an effective opposition, then you could argue that the most important challenge we face is reforming the electoral system. I don't think it's incidental to the bigger issues we face. I think it's part and parcel of them. Thank you very much, David. <laughs> we now move to our next speaker, Michael Mansfield QC, who, by special exception, because he has to leave early, will have seven minutes rather than five. Well, <clears throat> I did say to somebody, if it, I'm going to stand up, because is that easier for people to see? Can you hear as well? Yeah, I think it's better. And then I can see you. Um, I hope you don't mind me doing it this way. Excuse, I didn't ask permission of the chair. I was saying to somebody before I started, well, if it takes a lot to get two extra minutes, we're never going to get proper democracy, are we? So uh, um, I hope it's not. I, I want to say, really, this is the third time I've stood right here in this church on these same issues. The last time was 2012, and then there was a time before that, I've forgotten the exact year now, over the last decade. This discussion has been going on for too long. People have been aware of, of the headline, essentially, that's in uh, The Guardian. Are The Guardian here, and are you covering it? Let's hope. Um, it was in The Guardian about two weeks ago. Democracy is broken, debased, and distrusted. Now, I'm not the only one. I've been saying that for the last decade. 
And a lot of people in, well, we're supposed to be middlers. Well, a lot of people in Middle England have, uh, have agreed, because I've spoken on this topic throughout the United Kingdom. And why have they agreed? They've agreed because essentially, a decade or more ago, people had woken up to the fact that, well, it's like the graffiti that appeared on bridges and all over, certainly in London it did, and, and elsewhere, I've no doubt. You know, if voting changed anything, they'd make it illegal. And people had got to the stage in the United Kingdom, as well as elsewhere, that actually, it's not going to make a fat lot of difference. For all sorts of reasons, the electoral system, you've just heard about that, was producing a situation which did not reflect, the title of my talk is The Value of the Vote, did not reflect the value of the vote, because actually it was a managed system, managed in such a way that we had a one-party state. And if you look at the two parties post-Thatcher, the difference between them is paper thin. Why? Because they want power. And what's behind the power that they want, both of them, not all the MPs in all the parties, but the crucial elitist, the Westminster bubble, what's behind that? Well, it won't surprise you to learn from me that vested interest has waged a much more powerful influence on our government. NHS, privatisation. People on both sides of the political divide have got their fingers in private companies. Not to do with the vote, it's to do with how much money you can plough in. And that actually is the core of the article in The Guardian. A change to the, the system in which not just the vote is really reflected in the re complexion of the House of Commons or our Parliament, but also we've got to start managing how much money is being spent by the vested interests to support the parties they want in a much more scrutinised way. And of course we've got Mr Farage on the front page of The Guardian today being scrutinised for money in Europe. Well, we'll see how that one turns out. So money is very much at the core of this. So what one's wanting here, and I, what I want to say today, I want to make one proposal, because I don't think in five minutes you'll get much, well, seven, <laughs> you'll get more than one, and it's one that I proposed in an article that I wrote for The Guardian a month ago. And it, it's a simple idea. And actually, it's reflected in your program, because on the second page, and Dennis has already said it, really, since the date of the original Putney debates uh, in 1647, there hasn't been another constitutional convention of a similar kind. And I think the time has come. And there are a number of groups, I don't know whether they're here today, Open Democracy, Compass, Assemblies for Democracy, all coming together under one umbrella and saying to the people who found this year in Brexit, it wasn't necessarily just about immigration, although it's often dressed up like that. Personally, personally, what I thought the merit of it, and to be perfectly honest, didn't realise until the vote was in, people were saying we've had enough of the way in which we've been managed and we've been overlooked. And Trump, in a sense, he's hit a button, hasn't he? The forgotten people. There are a lot of people in this country who feel that the system we have of government has forgotten them, ignored them, has arrogance. How many of you have forgotten about the expenses debate we had, how they tried to cover up until the Daily Telegraph got hold of it, tried to cover up what they were doing with their moats and birdhouses and goodness knows what else. That was the level of arrogance that you had in a system where people thought they could get away with it. When only a year or two before that, you had a Prime Minister, Mr Blair, who thought that he could go to war essentially using effectively the royal prerogative. And what do we get now over Brexit? The, the whole debate recently, and I don't want to go through the debate itself, I think the Supreme Court were absolutely right. But one of this sort of minor hitches that they were having to face was, does the royal prerogative, well, does the royal prerogative overrule, allow? Sorry, what are we doing with the royal prerogative in this day and age? I'm sorry, it's got a, I'm not going to talk about the monarchy generally. I'm just talking about the royal prerogative for the moment. 
That is something you have to consider removing. If there is and should be a national convention on these issues, you can have your say as to whether you want a royal prerogative in this day and age. And I think, personally, it has to go. There shouldn't be that reserve power. We should have a situation in which, when you vote, like pe as people did in the Brexit, you see your vote reflected. In the American system, we wouldn't have Trump, would we? Well, I say we. Um, I say that because uh, there's a certain prime minister we've now got who seems to be um, accommodating him in a way that some of you may find a little inappropriate. However, however... It's a situation in which we have to consider whether these aspects, the value of the vote, can count if you have a situation in which it's reflected in the government. You don't have in the United States of America. He wouldn't be there if the vote had been mattered. It would be Hillary Clinton. Whether things have been dramatically different is another matter. What I'm saying is the vote is not being valued at the moment, at all in our system. It has to be dramatically changed. And i just finish on this note. I accept what has been said by the first speaker about the fact you can't run a country, as the, the Greeks may have done in a direct democracy, you can't have referenda from every issue. But think about this. Nobody seems to you know, really reflect on the fact Corbyn comes out with three-line wit. You know, you've got to allow this through. Why have we got to allow this through? The court said go back to Parliament. Okay. Go back to Parliament, what, for a rubber stamp, or, or do we have a proper debate? We have a proper debate, and we ought to be having a proper debate. Because, essentially, when it goes back to Parliament, there, has to, there are two sides to this. And the referendum, and the, the point I'm wanting to make finally is, it's not an overwhelming majority. Yes, it's a simple first-past-the-post majority. But I ask you like that, you might think, as you do in many companies and constitutions, you need a two-thirds majority. And then I think people would be saying, and less angry and less bitter, if you're going to use referendum, there's got to be more sophistication. Problem with this one was nobody realised that actually it was just advisory. I'm sitting down because I'm getting advice. Thank you. Our next speaker is John Rees, who will talk about the levellers and the sovereignty of the people. Yes, I want to go back to um, the great unanswered question um, in the Putney debates, and it was unanswered in 1647. It's arisen time and time again in our history. It's arising again now, and it remains unanswered. And it occurred like this. Colonel Thomas Rainsborough, who was the highest ranking uh, officer in the New Model Army who supported the Levellers, um, was advocating the Levellers' agreement of the people, a constitutional um, proposal for the settlement of the nation. And in the course of debate, he uttered the words, which now, thanks to my old friend Giles Fraser, when he was vicar of this parish, are now set in stone above your heads. He said... For really I think that the poorest he that is in England hath a life to live as the greatest he. And he continued directly after that to say that no man should live under a government that he hasn't first had a hand in making. In reply to Rainsborough's point, Cromwell and his son-in-law, Commissary General Henry Arton, said, we cannot accept this proposal we cannot accept the agreement of the people because, in Cromwell's words, it tends to anarchy. And Cromwell and Arton said, if you give the poor the vote, they will use the vote to take property away from the rich. And Arton, in a famous moment, said, all that I say, in other words, all that I am arguing today is because I have an eye to property. Now, we know that actually both sides of that argument were wrong. It wasn't true that if you gave people the vote, they would necessarily use it to take property away from the rich. And we also know that when they've tried, uh, they've met many, many obstacles, some of them parliamentary, very often extra-parliamentary obstacles for attempting 
to use the power of the vote in that way. My suggestion really is this, that that crisis is reoccurring. The constitutional crisis that we have is because there is a wider and more fundamental crisis which has been running for a generation now and which has corroded the previous political system and the previous political settlement. It's broken down because in that period, wealth, far from trickling down, has gushed up. It is happening because we live in a society where the gap between the rich and the poor is now greater than it was when Charles Dickens wrote Hard Times. It is corroding because neoliberal economics have hollowed out the welfare state consensus, have replaced atomization uh, where there were collective forms of provision, and has reduced very large sections of the population to a sense of economic and political hopelessness. Let me put it as simply as this. When I was born, I think my mother and my father felt that I was certain to have a better life than they'd had in the 1920s and the 1930s. And they were right. I was the first person in my family to be born in an NHS hospital. I was the first person in my family to come home to a house which was provided by public provision. I was the first person in my family to be cared for throughout my life by a system which was free at the point of need. I was the first person in my life, in my family, ever to go to university. And when I went to university, the grant and the fees and the travel to and from the college were paid for out of general taxation. I did have a better life than my parents. But I think there are millions and millions of working people in this country who cannot think the same now as my parents thought then. They think that their son or daughter is going to have a harder life than they are. They think they will find it harder to get a house, more difficult to be treated when ill. They think they will be find it harder to go through university, or at least to go through university without having a catastrophic level of debt, and certainly a lot harder to find a house or a job, even actually in the university sector, which isn't now looking rather like an academic version of a Costa Coffee contract. So this is the fundamental problem. There is a constitutional settlement which has now been ripped apart by economic development. I think there could be many, many reforms. Just, just let me give you one. Henry Martin, the Leveller MP, um, when, the House of Com when the House of Lords was abolished, the motion said that it was useless and dangerous. Henry Martin was on his feet in the Commons to say it should be abolished because it was useless but not dangerous. I think perhaps we arrived at that point. We move now to Richard Serebji, who will talk about Athens, 17th century England, and the contrast with 18th and 19th century America, all in five minutes. <laughs> Uh, can, can you hear the microphone? Is it working? Yes? Good. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, I'll have to leave some bits of that out. <clears throat> Athens had a direct democracy, but that was because uh, the voters were a the very small proportion of the city of Athens. They were the adult males. Um, uh, they were required to attend the assembly. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, if they voted for war, it was they or their sons who would go to war. Uh, they knew exactly what was going on. They went to the assembly all the time. And if they made a mistaken vote, they could change it the next morning. Now, we can't do that in a huge country, and that's why we have a representative democracy. Um, uh, that's in order to have uh, MPs who have the authority to get at the facts which in a huge country people can't be expected to know, and to ask questions. Now, it's wonderful what the Supreme Court has done in the last week. It has restored parliamentary sovereignty and prevented the executive from uh, bypassing a parliament 
on the Brexit issue that's before us. Uh, furthermore, um, it has upheld what uh, started, I think, in 1611, that <clears throat> uh, the use of royal prerogative by any party, uh, currently by the executive, um, has to conform to the laws of the land. So it's wonderful what the Supreme Court has done. I'm going to raise two questions which are not in my sphere of expertise at all. So my two questions may be balmy, uh, but I'm very lucky that there are plenty of people who can refute me here. So here's my balmy two questions. The use of the referendum recently was very good because it was the first opportunity to reveal that there was so much resentment in the, in the country. To that extent, it was a very useful thing. But, first point, very short, uh, the idea that that <clears throat> referendum should be binding was just uh, the former prime minister's say so, and of course, then it was repeated, but I think it was the verdict of the Supreme Court that that had no standing because Parliament didn't write it into the Act. Of course, once the Prime Minister had said it, the next Prime Minister said it, and all the politicians repeated it, even though it had no legal standing, the problem was, it, of course, it had psychological standing. But in future, we should make sure that we don't want a uh, uh, just the executive or the head of the executive to decide whether something's going to be binding. It should be Parliament. Now, the second thing is this. The referendum was put as one question, even though the issues were very many. Now, in a representative democracy, uh, the, 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 the people just couldn't know who, whom to believe. They were told quite contradictory things how could they possibly know, unlike the Athenian male adults, how could they know wh whom to believe? Unlike the entry into the European Union, there was no prior knowledge of what the European Union's terms were going to be. When we entered, there'd been a lot of preparation and a lot was known about the terms. Now nothing is known about the terms. What this, in effect, did, putting one question when, in fact, there were many questions to be asked, was to transfer power, not only from Parliament, but this time from Parliament and from the people, because the people were being asked a question they couldn't possibly assess uh, the answer to. Uh, what's happened now is that the executive gives its own answers to those many questions that the public was never asked, and says, uh, this is what the people decided. No, the poor people were never asked the relevant questions. I'll come to what the questions were, which will be my last point. Have I got 16 seconds? Well, here are my points. Uh, a questionnaire isn't practical, I know, but we want to think of something that is practical, because what needed to be asked were these things. Which of these do you want most? More control of your borders against immigrants? More sovereignty for the UK Parliament? More prosperity? More equality? More jobs? More funds for the NHS? Reducing regulations, if so, which ones? Or anything else you like? That's what we wanted to know. And then the people could have been asked, when Parliament decides uh, whether we're going to stay in or out, which of these considerations do you, the people, want to be uppermost? That would have given real power to the people you're and constrain the executive. You're out of time. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. We now move to our queue. We will talk on contemporary populism and what it signifies. A report on President Trump's inaugural compared it to President Obama's first inaugural and declared Obama radiated hope Trump channeled rage. This was factually correct, but if so, it needs diagnosis. Why hope then and rage now? An obvious answer is because the hope was not fulfilled, and so roughly half the electorate refused to believe that Obama's anointed successor in the Democratic Party, nor even the orthodox core of the Republican Party, 
would fulfill the hope either. Brexit seems to be channeling the same rage against Britain's political establishment. But the political establishment is not a self-standing class. Even a glance at the lineup of support for the Remain vote and for Clinton, both in the primaries against Sanders and in the presidential elections, shows the extent to which what underlies the political class is a parade of corporate and banking elites, ranging from the IMF, Wall Street, OECD, and Soros, to the governor of the Bank of England. That leads into the subject of how to understand the meaning of populism as a term of opprobrium. The term is defined as ordinary people's opposition to elites. So defined, it's too underdescribed to be a term of opprobrium. After all, democracy is a counter to elites in political governance. What distinguishes populism is that it also opposes the power of unelected officials with specific economic interests to dominate the formation of policies with the general acquiescence of elected representatives. But this still does not capture what we instinctively recoil from in populism. How can it be wrong to oppose the voluntary implicit surrender of sovereignty by elected policymakers to unelected wielders of elite financial interests? Suppose that a working or workless person in Nottingham or Crete or Seville were to ponder the humane policies that some nations in Europe came to embrace since the Second World War, policies which provided safety nets for people like him. He might ask, what was the site where these safety nets were administered and implemented? And he would answer, well, the site of the nation. He might scratch his head and wonder, has there ever been a supranational site at which welfare was ever administered? What would a mechanism that dispensed it at a supranational site even so much as look like? Now, of course, such a person might go on beyond these shrewd questions to associate supranational affiliation with immigrant hordes who not only deprive him of economic opportunities, but, di but dilute the centuries-long national culture of which he's so proud. But there's no logical link between those excellent former questions and these latter trumped-up anxieties. One may rightly ask the questions without having these anxieties. And so here at last we have what is the defining element of populism from which we recoil. The term stands for precisely the assumption of such a link, a link that is uncompulsory. So a question arises, whence the compulsion to make this uncompulsory link? And here we must resist the temptation to blame the people themselves. The assumption they make of such a link is not due to their feebleness of mind, but to a wide variety of distortions, not only by the media they read and watch, but by the political class, and not just the extreme elements of that class, but the political establishment. We cannot forget that the British Prime Minister's Remain campaign ratcheted up the immigration theme to prevent it being owned by the more extreme right opposition just as Obama, in his first campaign, was far worse on immigration than John McCain, again with a view to gaining ownership of a Repub Republican platform for electoral gains. So the lesson is this. Even if we identify what we recoil from in populism as the uncompulsory linking of sound questions with unsound anxieties, this cannot simply be attributed to an intrinsic incapacity in the judgment of ordinary people, but must be attributed to the failure of public education provided by the media and the political class. One cannot believe in democracy and dismiss the electorate as vile and stupid, for the electorate is shaped by what knowledges it possesses. For 20 hundred years, philosophers have said that the ethical question is what ought we to do? But we live in such a complex time that the more crucial prior question has become, what ought we to know? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We go to Vernon Bogdanor on popular sovereignty. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I want to argue for popular sovereignty 
uh, but perhaps I'd better preface my remarks by saying that I voted remain in the referendum. Um, the referendum, as we all know, was advisory, but the government said it would be bound by the result. Parliament, which cannot be bound by the result, feels bound by it, and the outcome is that MPs have voted for a policy which the vast majority oppose. That's an event without precedent in our long parliamentary history. It's never occurred before. And it is the reason, I think, why my colleague at King's, Professor Takis Tridimus, said that the referendum was the most important constitutional event in this country since 1660. Because those who voted to leave wanted to restore parliamentary sovereignty, but that is now being constrained, not by Brussels, but by the people. I think that the referendum is also the most important political event we've had since 1945, and shares with 1945 the fact that both repudiate a pre-existing establishment. And we were told that some people think that Parliament is the people assembled in the legislature, but the referendum shows how out of touch the House of Commons is with public opinion. Around 75 MPs, 75% 75 MPs are for Remain. The leaders of all three major parties are for Remain. Only two parties favoured Brexit, UKIP with one MP and the Democratic Unionist Party of Northern Ireland with eight. That makes nine out of 650. The referendum showed a tremendous unfulfilled demand for political participation in Britain as did the Scottish referendum in 2014. 72% voted, the highest turnout in any referendum or national election since 1992. And part of the reason for that, and this follows what David Runciman has been saying, in a general election, around three quarters of the seats are safe for any one party. There's no point really in voting. But in the referendum, every vote counts. So there's an incentive for people to vote. There are no safe seats and it appears there was a particular incentive for many Labour voters living in safe seats in the north of England, many of whom seem not to have voted since the time of Margaret Thatcher. But the notion of popular sovereignty has come under attack, primarily, I think, from those who don't like the outcome. And their fears were well uh, expressed by uh, an official of the European Commission before we had our first referendum on Europe in 1975, and this is Mr. Jean Ray um, speaking in London in 1974. He said, a referendum on this matter consists of consulting people who don't know the problems instead of consulting people who know them. I would deplore a situation in which the policy of this great country should be left to housewives. It should be decided instead by trained and informed people. And some of those who oppose popular sovereignty use the same arguments used by conservatives in the 19th century against the expansion of the franchise, that the people are too ignorant and confused to know their own interests, too easily misled by deceitful propaganda, and their interests are best represented by those with property and education. Now, um, the uh, exercise of uh, popular sovereignty in the referendum revealed something very important about Britain, um, the main cleavage, I suppose, in politics now is primarily one of education uh, between those who have the skills to cope in a globalised society, which I suspect includes everyone here, you might call us the exam-passing classes, and those who don't have those skills. And the referendum revealed that fissure very clearly indeed. And um, we've seen in this referendum the politics of identity uh, hitting back with a vengeance because the politics of identity in the past has concerned itself primarily with the identity of minorities, whether subnational, uh, ethnic, or sexual, not the identity of the majority, which is the white English working class. And any expression of that identity has been seen as somehow illegitimate or even racist. And since the referendum, there's been much criticism of the supposed bigotry of Leave voters. But sadly, if you seek to find bigotry in Britain, you have to look elsewhere amongst the elites. Sadly, in my old university, whose chair of the University Labour Club resigned because he said the Labour Club had serious problems with Jews. Sadly, in the Labour Party, where a non-Jewish MP 
so that anti-Semitism in the Labour Party is combined with misogyny. She said there was misogyny at the top of the party. She's had 600 rape threats in a single night, reported the worst of them, but has heard nothing back. And I doubt that anti-Semitism or rape threats were quite such a problem amongst those who voted leave. So I think the danger of bigotry in Britain comes not from the exercise of popular sovereignty, but from the intolerance of elites, many of them university educated. And the vote for Brexit was in part an assertion of majority identity, and the referendum has brought that question to the fore for Theresa May's government to resolve, though I suspect it is not only a constitutional question, but even more a social and cultural question. People used to say about politics, it's the economy, stupid. I think now we should say it's culture, stupid. Thank you. Thank you. We now go to Anna Coot, who will speak on building a new social commons, people and parliament working together. Good afternoon. I want to focus on the Commons, not the House of Commons so much as the Commons. There's a growing movement, as some of you may know, in Europe and across the world, where people are claiming shared control of resources that are central to human life, like water, land, and energy. Groups organize to manage and distribute these resources in the interests of everyone, not just the rich and privileged. Protagonists of the commons are challenging the enclosure of life's necessities by powerful corporate interests, often supported by governments. They recognize that everyone has a right to these necessities, and we all share responsibility for making sure everyone's rights are respected. But these rights only exist if they are claimed, fought for, and defended. So the commons is a process, a political struggle, as well as the resources that are struggled for. Just as we need natural resources like land and water, so we need social resources, help from others to stay well and lead good lives. And that's why we must claim and build a new social commons. That's protection from risks we can't cope with alone, ill health, homelessness, frailty, unemployment, access to education, social care, a decent income, not as concessions, but as a matter of right for all. This means reimagining and reinventing the best elements of the welfare state to embody the collective ideal, to put people in control, to assert and defend the principle of fair and equal access. And it's urgent to do this now to find a new language and ways of working that will strengthen solidarity and social justice at a time when politics are increasingly divisive and exclusionary and to help us withstand the shock of leaving the EU. The founding values and purpose of the post-war settlement have been worn to shreds by the application of market rules contracting out, competition and choice, privatization, and by spending cuts that have left a tattered and tawdry safety net. So it's no surprise that people feel angry and cheated. But if there's a growing urge to throw out the bathwater of established institutions, we must rescue the baby of collective action, shared resources, and mutual aid. And the EU, whatever its flaws, has been a source and defense of progressive social policies. The New Economics Foundation has proposals for building the social commons, which I have no time to summarize here, so just two points. First, the commoning movement is not about rolling back the state, but about transforming relations between people and the state. It's a fight, if you like, against the enclosure of power which is also one of life's necessities. And for the social commons, there's a crucial role for a transformed state in setting standards, distributing funds, and guaranteeing fair access. Secondly, the social commons must be shaped through democratic dialogue. We've got good formats for involving people in decisions, 
town hall meetings, digital forums, citizens' juries, people's assemble, assemblies, and at best, they tap into the wisdom that people form in their everyday lives and enable them to engage in informed discussion, scrutinizing evidence, questioning experts, arguing and debating, and, and changing their minds. And this is a far cry from the referendum format, where powerful interests set out to enclose the popular vote. But policymakers too easily brush off decisions that are formed through democratic dialogue. So the challenge is how to create a three-way dynamic between <coughs> popular participation, formal expertise, and representative politics. With national parliaments and local councils as active champions and participants, rather than bystanders or manipulative sponsors, in a national deliberative dialogue. That's how we want to start building the social commons. And so in conclusion, let's imagine a future where our ways of doing politics are focused on the commons, the means of securing life's necessities, natural, social, and political for everyone, shared resources, equally accessible according to need, enshrined in laws forged through open, informed, democratic dialogue, and an end to the enclosures of the 21st century. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anna. We come to our last speaker in this session, Alex Runswick, Brexit and the case for a people's constitution. Thank you. I'm going to build on what previous speakers have said about both the sense of a political crisis, but also the challenges between um, popular and parliamentary sovereignty, and argue that what we need to move towards is a more participatory democracy, um, and that the first step in that journey should be the creation of a people's constitution. And by this, I mean um, a single codified document which sets out what the government can and can't do in our name that's drafted after public in, um, involvement in a deliberative process to determine what we, the people, think should be in a constitution. And for me, these two strands, the public involvement and the codification of a constitution, are equally important. Codified constitutions can and have been uh, written by lawyers and academics, and in the last parliament, the Political and Constitutional Reform Committee did a very good job of doing just that. Um, but unless we collectively help to shape the principles, rights, and freedoms in the constitution, it's going to do very little to address this sense of political crisis that we've been discussing, and the very real disconnect between parliament and the people. It will simply reinforce that politics is something that is done to people and that a democracy is somewhere where we live rather than something that we actively participate in. Like other speakers, I don't think this one reform is a panacea that is going to cure all ills. As events in the United States are showing at the moment, constitutions only work when people are willing to fight to uphold them, when judges are willing to tell prime ministers or presidents that they don't actually have the power to do the thing that they want to do, or where acting attorney generals are willing to refuse to implement executive orders that they don't believe to be lawful. But to have that public buy-in, I believe we in the UK need our we the people moment. It's often said that codifying our constitution would against our tradition of incremental reform. Now, whatever, the confident, whatever confidence the current government has in its plans, and I do worry sometimes that we have government by affirmation, where if we say things often enough, it will in fact come to pass, um, it's undoubtable that we are embarking on a course that is without precedent and is anything but incremental. This is why I think we have an opportunity to strengthen our democracy. The government's battle in the courts to withdraw the UK from the EU using the royal prerogative highlighted how lacking a codified constitution leaves our democracy and many of the important mechanisms that underpin it to be open to the interpretation of the government of the day. From grey areas around the legal force of referendums through to the limits of prerogative powers, our unwritten constitutional conventions, where they exist at all, have more often than not been a source of confusion rather than clarity. 
As we move through the process of leaving the EU, these fundamental constitutional questions will only become more pressing, even critical to survival of the United Kingdom. A long-term settlement is needed, and a written constitution devised by and for the people can deliver the certainty we need in our own democratic system to reshape our position in the world. To face the future together, as the Prime Minister so desires, we must shape the future together. There must be clear, consistent and scrutinisable balance between the national interest, the interest of the government of the day, and the rights and freedoms of, of citizens. And we need a new constitutional settlement to resolve these broad questions. We need clarity about where power lies, what powers the devolved parliaments have, how they relate to each other, and who has the authority to make changes to that relationship. While powers continue to be devolved, these more fundamental questions have never been resolved. Rather, there have been conventions and understandings, many of which the Supreme Court's judgment called into question. Set setting out where power lies also means being clear about the separation of powers. The different powers of the executive, the government and the civil service, the legislature, which makes laws but does not administer them, and the judiciary, which rules on what is lawful when it is disputed. A written constitution would also define what rights and powers we, the people, have. It would not only set out key rights from freedom of speech to privacy, the right to assembly or stand, to stand in elections, it would go further, it could also go further than the traditional political and civil rights, and it could include social and economic rights, such as the rights to housing and healthcare, as in the South African constitution. Crucially, it would also set out how these rights are protected and what we could do if the government breached them. It would be a sad irony that if after a campaign centred around taking back control, more power would be ceded to Westminster than the political establishment rather than to the people. It would be a betrayal of voters whose trust in politics is waning, contrary to the very spirit and aims of the Leave campaign, and a lost opportunity to empower the people of the United Kingdom. Thank you. Well, thank you, speakers, for basically keeping to the time and also for raising many different and sometimes competing ideas about the Constitution. So now the, the, we, we have 20 minutes amongst the panelists for discussion, backwards and forwards, and then after that, as mentioned, we'll open it up to the audience. So amongst the panelists, I wonder who'd like to start off with a comment or observation or question to one of the other panelists. David, yes, off you go. I just wanted to say we've heard a lot about how uh, we've been living through an extended period of disempowerment of the people, which has then produced these um, eruptions, if that's one word for it, of um, anger and resentment. But we haven't talked at all about the fact we've lived through 30 years of extraordinary empowerment as well. It's just not political, it's social, and it's technological. Um, so there hasn't been a political revolution, but there's been a social revolution. I mean, this is the age of Trump and Brexit, and it's also the age of Facebook. And this technology has empowered people in extraordinary ways. Um, access to information, but also their ability to express themselves, to express opinions. So the vote might not count, but there are lots of things you can vote on apart from politics these days, and if that's the way you want to be empowered. And I completely agree with Vernon that um, it's a big mistake to think that the resentment is all one way. I mean, there's probably, I agree, there's probably, we've seen post-Brexit, the fact that the losers in that vote are more resentful even than the people they think voted against them and have behaved far worse as well. Um, but we heard earlier that you know, the, the point about Brexit was it revealed the resentment. Well, you, the resentment was there for everyone to see online. I mean, you have to be blind not to notice the resentment. The problem in the age of Facebook is that it's been unbelievably fractured because it's excessively individualistic. So I think what we've had is a period where Resentment is either almost on an individual by individual level, or we get these moments of political choice where it's a binary winner-take-all choice. I mean, I think trying to funnel the resentment through a referendum decision was a mistake. But it's not that the resentment wasn't there. The thing that's missing is that middle ground where you can channel the resentment in, in other ways. But we shouldn't think that this is just an age of disempowerment. It's an age of empowerment, just not in politics. Thank you, David. There, but those who 
felt resentful had no leverage because many of them lived in very safe seats. And that's right. your point about the electoral yeah. system. Um, the people who count electorally are those who live in marginal seats, who yeah. generally aren't the least privileged. I think the referendum showed that. Can I just make one point about a constitution, which I, I mean, I think can't, that I can't see any logical argument against the constitution, but if, the, the barrier to a constitution conceptually is the sovereignty of parliament. If parliament is sovereign, there's no point having a constitution, because the constitution simply be what the Queen in Parliament enact is law. So the first thing to do if you have a constitution is for Parliament to agree to abdicate its sovereignty. OK, thank you, David and Vernon. Uh, Anna? Yes, to, to respond to this point about empowerment, which I think is, is an important one, but um, I don't think we should forget about the way in which our hopes that uh, the social media would provide a counterpoint to the power of the press and the national media has been, have, have been dashed, actually, the... And what, what, what we see now is a, is a really horrifying, vicious circle whereby the national media have found out how to use the social media as an echo chamber and a reinforcer. And people who get their um, sources of information from Facebook, for example, have, are, are trapped in kind of uh, small eddies, if you like, of, uh, of, of opinions of, that have been formed for them by the filtering systems of the social media. So, I mean, we've still got to address that problem because that's got an awful lot to do with the ways in which opinions are formed and channeled through to things like referenda and also elections. So we don't let's overlook the power of this new um, configuration of influence through this uh, alliance between the con conventional media, if you like, and the new social media. Thank you, Anna. We'll go Akhil and then to Shona. Yeah, I, I wanted to, to second some of the things that was just said. Uh, you know, it's an interesting thing that if you look at the Middle East, the whole map of the Middle East, including the, the uh, transformations, what, what came to be called Arab Spring, didn't come from social media. It came from one television station of conventional media. One television station changed the Middle East. It beamed into people's homes every evening just how corrupt the ruling elites and royals were for about eight or nine years when Al Jazeera was actually doing good work. And it was conventional media that empowered people simply with information and analysis that was not available for decades before that. Thank you. Uh, Shona? Um, I'd just like to say that I think recent events have, have shown that the loser is the British Constitution. If we take three principles that are very, very important, um, power of the executive, parliamentary sovereignty, rights of the people, none of them have been shown to be working very well recently. Uh, Michael Mansfield was talking about the royal prerogative subject to the recent Supreme Court case. And when you say royal prerogative, it does sound very ancient and medieval. But all countries have executive power that the leader can use. If we think about what's going on in the US right now, what Trump is doing with executive orders, that's another illustration of it, and perhaps of its misuse. There has to be some sort of executive power. It's what you do with it. Likewise, parliamentary sovereignty which was seen as the winner in the Supreme Court case. Highly, highly reasoned case, very detailed. Then what happens? You get a two-clause bill, Parliament debates the matter really, really quickly before there's even a white paper. How is that the empowerment or the sovereignty of Parliament? I fail to see. Popular sovereignty. Um, in response to what Vernon was saying earlier about the referendum, I suppose, my, and I, I agree, this is such a big, important change, but I teach comparative constitutional law, and one of the early classes we go through with students is to look at constitutional amendments, and we ask them about constitutions that are easy or difficult to amend, and the British Constitution is the easiest of all. It would be virtually impossible in any other jurisdiction in the world to amend our constitution as easily as is going to happen now with Brexit and removal from the EU. Doesn't mean that people's wills shouldn't be respected, 
But maybe, maybe there should be other mecha mechanisms in place as well. Maybe second referendum, for example. But I think we should remember that we don't, we don't have that right now. And that is enabling this situation and this very divided society which we have to continue. Thank you, Shona. John. Yeah, I wanted to come back to the question that David raised about the, the communications revolution, because in a way we are going through a communications revolution in the way that the radicals in the 17th century were. The printing press wasn't new, it was old, but the ability to use it on a mass scale for petitioning and pamphlet distribution um, was new as censorship broke down at the beginning of the English Revolution. And that's kind of my point, really. It's about whether or not the means of communication can be linked to collective forms of political organization. That's what makes it popularly empowering. In and of itself, only to, a, only to a degree, and I think there are important caveats to be issued as well, one of which you know, uh, Anne's made, perhaps w one reform proposal will be to uh, free the algorithm on Facebook, which restricts you to that uh, limited audience around your own, around your own views. Um, but more than that, um, it allows a mass of information. But I would say, and, I, and I've had some experience with this recently, um, I would also say it's an age when high-grade research and contextualized information is more firmly behind a paywall than at any time I can, I, I can remember. If you don't have access to essentially a university status, you're locked out of that world unless you pay enormous amounts, uh, enormous amounts of money. I think that's uh, an, an important disempowering thing. And the other major caveat is this. Um, there is a, a very important and powerful use of, of social media for uh, collective enlightenment and uh, organization. Uh, but the power of the state is also massively enhanced by this they can watch you and monitor you and see things about you in ways that no previous state was able to do because of exactly the same um, communications, uh, communications revolution. So there are dangers as well as, 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 as positives, and none of it substitutes for the business of actually organising for political change. I mean, I was in Tahir Square for nine out of the 18 days that brought down the Mubarak regime. For three of those, the regime turned off uh, the entirety of social media, and amazingly, uh, the revolution didn't grind to a halt in that period. Thank you, John. I wonder if I could just slightly change the, the course of our debate by asking particularly Alex, who talked about a written constitution. This question has been on the books in Britain for many years now. I wonder if you could say, Alex or others, what are the obstacles to having a written constitution. What you put in it is one issue. Let's just put that aside for the moment. But why can't we have a written constitution? What, do you have any views about that? Well, I mean, the most obvious one is that people with power very rarely give it away. Um, but, I mean, there, there are lots of obstacles to a written constitution. One, as I've mentioned, is, a, is around our political culture and the idea that things are done incrementally and, and slowly yeah, over time. You speak into your mic. Yeah. Sorry. Um, so w one obstacle is around the incrementalism and the belief that we shouldn't make radical changes. Um, whenever you discuss constitutional reform, it's always dismissed either as you know, some kind of third term issue or something that people don't raise on doorsteps or it's, you know, it's very worthy, but you know, there are other issues that are more important right now. And what I would just say about that is actually people do raise it on doorsteps, they just don't raise it in using that language. The, the, where there are actually contacts between politicians and voters on doorsteps, and that's increasingly rare and part of the problem, um, you know, they are talking about that sense of the lack of control, the instabilities in their lives, the, the inability to, sh to shape the agenda. So I think that's, that's one um, set of obstacles. There are, I don't think what we put in it is actually particularly an obstacle. I think there are lots of different ways that it is possible to come to those decisions. Um, I think the, I mean, Vernon raised one of the big issues, which particularly if you want the kind of constitution that I want, where you actually have public involvement, that does involve Parliament giving away power and, and sharing power with the people in a way that they have not yet been willing to do. 
Thank you. I mean, one of the reasons why it's become part of the debate is that people aren't sure precisely what the rules are, they're uncertain what the Constitution actually is. But that's also the reason why we haven't got one, because we're, as it were, on a journey and we don't know what the final point will be, where we'll end up, say, on the second chamber, the electoral system, role of referendums, all the rest of it. And there's not a real consensus on what the final aim should be. So, um, I mean, I, I wrote a book some years ago called The New British Constitution, and I think the worst thing about that is probably the title. It should have been A New British Constitution, question mark, because I think there is one, probably, but we're not quite clear what it is. And that's probably why we're not having a constitution. There's no real agreement. Mm -hmm. Any other observations on this issue? So, okay. I, mean, I, I would say that, I mean, part of, and we're seeing it now, is that to get the, the kind of wraparound change we're talking about, it almost certainly has to be triggered by a crisis. We are having such a crisis, but the trouble is the crisis gets in the way of the reform that you want, and it's always really hard to get that perfectly calibrated crisis, which is serious enough to make you redo what you do, but not so serious as to distract you from... Re um, it may be that the breakup of the United Kingdom, if it comes, will be that crisis. I mean, in, in a sense, it may also be the kind of crisis that overwhelms what we want to do, but it's hard to see if it happens, how the breakup of the United Kingdom won't provoke some pretty serious both... Sort of imperatives and opportunities to rethink some constitutional questions. But there is always the risk that the crisis simply overwhelms the space that you need to think these things through. And at the moment, I think it has overwhelmed the space. Can I make a brief f further practical point? If we're not going to get a constitution, uh, um, an interim step that in my view would be very valuable would be to be a charter of what powers are suitable for devolution and what we need to keep at the centre particularly in relation to the Scottish issue, but also in relation to devolution in England, which is now an ongoing policy. I mean, can we devolve, for example, the power to charge for health services? Can we devolve the power to build new grammar schools? Can, in other words, what sort of powers are suitable for devolution? Most of us, I think, would think we shouldn't devolve the power to charge for health services because that's part of our social union. And I think those are the sorts of things we could embody in a document which would fall short of a constitution but be a step towards it perhaps. Alex, did you want to... I just very quickly, um, I agree, you know, if, if I'm going to go give up my holistic approach, which I'm not exceeding yet, but, you know, for the sake of argument, um, I agree with Vernon okay. that devolution would be the urgent starting point. Um, the other way, if, you, if we wanted to be incremental about it, is uh, if you look at what New Zealand has done with their constitution, um, they've tried to, they've come up with a lovely parliamentary fudge where um, they've entrenched certain specific bits of law, so you have to have a supermajority to repeal those, which is in effect a, cons a codified constitution, but it, rather than it being a single document, it is specific pr provisions uh, around key issues like the fact that there have to be elections. So while for me the deliberative part of how we could get to a constitution and what we want to be in a constitution is very, very important. There are other incremental st steps that we could take. Thank you, Alex. Brief comment, Anna. J just to reiterate, really, that, that it's um, not just that it's difficult to find the right time, but it's really important to get the right method for arriving at the, at the conclusions of whatever this, uh, the charter would have in it or the constitution. And we really must pay as much attention as possible to designing a, a way of... of having that debate. Because if we don't have a debate that uh, can command at least a substantial degree of public trust, then what's the point of having a new constitution? Because nobody will trust it. So the quality of the debate, how it's done, what the format is, who's involved, how, how, how do they do it, who thinks they own it? I mean, you've made this point, but that's what we need to really focus on, I think. Okay. Uh Shown a brief comment on this yeah, point? Uh, well, it's actually just a brief comment on Vernon's point about um, a charter devolution. Um, I think it's a nice idea. The problem I see with that is that once you start entering that territory, you start to think about how to protect those powers. One obvious way might be through a reformed House of Lords that might become more of a federal chamber. But that's a, a major operation. We haven't managed to get House of Lords reform right. And I think you also automatically come across the England problem of what do we do? Because then we're moving towards something that looks more federal. And how do we deal with this point of England and English votes for English laws? And it automatically, I think, then turns into a much more major constitutional issue. Thanks. 
Right. One other issue, we're coming towards the end of this discussion, but there's one other issue we haven't talked that much about, and that is sovereignty of the people. There are members of this panel, and there are probably many of you out there who think, why shouldn't we have sovereignty of the people? After all, isn't that you know, part and parcel of a democratic system? I wonder, Vernon, if you'd like to just start off, because I know you've written suggesting that we actually do have uh, sovereignty of the people. I wonder if you just take us a little bit further. What does this mean? If that's the case, what does it mean in more practical constitutional terms? Well, there are some issues where it's been thought up to now that parliamentary approval is not sufficient. And the first issue that came up for that was Europe in 1975. And the argument for the referendum was not just that the party system wasn't working because all three major parties wanted, to, wanted us to join Europe, but the argument was decision by parliament would not by itself carry conviction, and the Heath government's decision to take Britain in by itself had not carried conviction and needed to be legitimized in a referendum. And Cameron used the same argument in 2014 in his Bloomberg speech. He said that consent for Europe was wafer thin and needed to be legitimized by another referendum. And I think that is right, and I think the referendums in both cases have tended to defuse tensions which otherwise might have uh, blown over. And similarly, people feel about the electoral system, the decision by Parliament would be self-interested, and therefore there must be a referendum, which we had in the alternative vote, and a decision to leave the United Kingdom to secede uh, requires not just a majority of MPs, I mean, the SNP would have that now, but uh, the vote of the people. And decisions also about radically new forms of political machinery, like directly elected mayors. The first one we had was London in 2000. People felt, well, that too should have a referendum. Um, and the other one is, is, of course, devolution. And people think, uh, rightly in my view, that Parliament shouldn't be able to transfer its powers to another body without a referendum, that MPs haven't a mandate for that, and you need to get it through a referendum. So I think there are some decisions where a, a vote by Parliament is not held to be fully legitimate and needs to be confirmed by a popular vote. Thank you. So there's a very clear statement of some of the advantages of popular democracy. Do any of our panelists want to comment on that or maybe take issue with? Uh, Shona? Yeah. Um, well, two points, really. Um, first is, as I said earlier, I think it's interesting that a lot of constitutions that do claim to derive their authority from the people, like the US federal constitution, which starts off in its preamble with we the people of the United States, actually, when it comes down to it, um, issues like countrywide referendums are not provided for by that constitution. The same is true of the German federal constitution. Um, I think I agree with Vernon that there might be some issues when it comes to how actually we govern ourselves, the very nature of the government of the polity, where a referendum might be desirable. But I think that the problem we are in right now in Britain is that we haven't worked out the constitutional rules to deal with that. We've done it in a very ad hoc way. Governments have used referendums in a very instrumental way for their own political purposes. It hasn't been principled at all. And I think that can be seen as a misuse of the referendum for political purposes, and I think that's regrettable. Akhil. Uh, you know, it, it, it's, but it's interesting and important to talk about the episodic element that referenda provide on the question of sovereignty of people, but uh, it would be nice also to, it, it would be nice also to just go back to what John Rees said in his talk about how the real deep problem is the problem raised by the levelers about how the, the materials and social surround raises a question about whether there is really going to be sovereignty of the people simply by these episodic simply by, by appeal to referendum. But it's, it's a much deeper problem, and I think that's just... I mean, it's worth saying, even though you couldn't possibly address it in a forum like this. Thank you. John. Yes, you see, I, mean, I, I think there's two questions about the sovereignty of the people, one of which you know, Vernon and other people have talked about, about how it functions within an, a kind of existing political system. But, of course, the, the way it originally arose in, in the 17th century because successively every aspect of the existing political system and some of the attempts to replace it 
were found inadequate. Trying to get rid of the king's advisers was inadequate. Trying to get the king to change his mind was inadequate. Trying to fight him to a standstill on the battlefield was inadequate. Defeating him on the battlefield was inadequate. Um, relying on parliament, lords and commons proved to be inadequate. And indeed, and, and indeed we arrive at the inevitable conclusion that you have to chop his head off. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, but, but, at that po but at that point, that is where the language of popular sovereignty arises. Salius populi supremus lex, the safety of the people is the highest law, that this man of blood can no longer be trusted uh, to be part of the constitution, therefore we have to completely redo it. That's where that came from. You know, Thomas Rainsborough's brother, William Rainsborough's battle flag, had a disembodied head of the king with an axe on it and the slogan, Salius Populi Supremus Lex, around it. And that was, if you like, the, the, the slogan under which we passed from any moment of thinking that the existing constitution could be moulded to actually ripping the whole thing up and then, through successive failures, arriving at something which then got passed da back down to us. And I think you know, David's question is, the, is, is the, the interesting one. At which point in that kind of unfolding crisis of the system, are we? And, and my feeling really is that we're only in the foothills of that at the moment, and much larger explosions lie ahead of us. And, and, uh, I mean, it is also, I mean, it's a slightly crass point, but it is worth remembering that, that the language of maybe not popular sovereignty, but of the power of the people, Donald Trump's inaugural address was a really striking piece of political rhetoric in which he said, this is not about the transfer of power from one president to another, from one party to another, but from this swamp to you, the people. And what that means in that case is not popular sovereignty, it means the enhanced power of the executive. But, I mean, that language, it's pretty slippery. Yeah, good. Okay, last point to you, Richard. Uh, I think it's very difficult to know who the people are. I think that was found the case in America, where the Constitution <clears throat> um, uh, was worried that majorities in states would uh, be too powerful over minorities and therefore the power should go to Congress. Then the amendments reversed. Um, Congress must be restricted and the power must go back to the states. Uh, and then only in the 14th Amendment do we get power to individuals all connected with slavery. And I think the same could happen in England. Uh, when we say part of the people, um, what about the people of Scotland? I mean, aren't we going to have a system, at least in the present stage, where some weight is given to the people of Scotland or the people of Northern Ireland who both had terrible problems? Um, surely just a majority of UK voters isn't going to meet our problems. So the people we've got to take notice of um, are, are different groups at different times. Yes, it's interesting. Now, various people have mentioned the American Constitution. We the people, of course, the Americans got we the people from our corporate fictitious notion of the people. Because if you look in that Constitution, as many have observed, the people are not there to be found. On that note, I must close the discussion amongst us here. We now open up the debate to the audience, and the rules are as such, as follows. So, you first of all, just tell us who you are. We'll try to get through everyone, but we have limited time. Secondly, you're permitted one comment or one question. So don't ask four questions and don't ask too many comment. Don't make too many. One comment, one question. So let's start. I'll do my best to be even-handed. Let me start with the gentleman at the back. Tell us who you are, please. Okay, my name is uh, Steve Freeman. Uh, I'm I want a comment and a question, really. No, just one comment or one question, please. One comment and one question, okay. One comment was in 1649 we became a commonwealth, and the commonwealth meant a republic, but it also meant commonwealth in the way I think Anna spoke about it, actually the common good. And in a certain sense, you might think we need to get our commonwealth back again. But we have to have a breach with the present situation, and I think Brexit, with what's happened in Scotland and in Northern Ireland possibly opens up a new situation for constitutional change. Now, my question was this, really, for clarification. People speak about parliamentary sovereignty. It sounds very democratic. Then we modify that by saying it's actually the Queen in Parliament, which sounds slightly less democratic, except we think, well, the Queen doesn't do anything very much anyway. I'm not underestimating what she does do, by the way. Doesn't seem much. But isn't it really the Crown in Parliament? We know that the... Mace has to be in Parliament, by the way, for Parliament to work. Now, the Crown, I think, is not the Queen. I think it's all of those powers that the executive use, 
And we are, so therefore, actually, between the Crown and Parliament, the Crown is the powerful body in this country. It's almost so, like a corporate body. So what's your question? I'm asking, I'm asking for clarification from the panel about whether the Queen in Parliament or the Crown in Parliament as a powerful corporate body, the executive power, is what we're dealing with. Thank so you between very much. the Crown and Parliament, it's the right. other way around. That, it's not the Queen. That's a very good question. Parliament. Thank you. Um, let's take uh, this gentleman over here on, the, on my far left. Thank you very much. Um, uh, my point is to ask the panel... What's your name, please? I beg your pardon. My name is Peter Lloyd. Um, what I want to ask the panel about is what they think the reasons are for this um, apparent and probably real uh, disaffection and disconnect from the people. Um, I, there are three areas which I think are ones which are, uh, could be partly responsible. One is the increase in supranational bodies. Uh, and by that, obviously, I'm thinking of the EU itself and the disconnect that came from that. Secondly, global bodies, where an extraordinary amount of legislation and activity and uh, interest comes from down from the top down and has a lot of power. A lot of powerful people go to the UN first, for example. The third one is the media, where I noticed that uh, the most important thing for Tony Blair and subsequently for David Cameron was to convince the media that what they were doing was right, and they thought power came through the media, which is another reason why they, had a, they didn't think they needed to go and address the interests or the views of the people as a whole. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Um, let, let's take um, this young lady straight through here. Hi, Emma Oldham. I'm asking a question on behalf of my students. Can you speak up, please. Oh, I'm asking a question on behalf of my students. We've been debating recently whether prisoners should have the vote, and I was just wondering where you feel that they sit within the sovereignty of the people. Thank you. All right. We'll, we'll field a few questions and then come back to our panellists a bit later. Um, I'm going to take someone from over this side. Yes, here in the front row, please. Uh, thank you, uh, George Muir. Just a point, really. I, I wonder if the panel would recognize this distinction when asking uh, uh, questions for, for voting questions. What struck me is that people, when they're, when they're voting, are very good at judging people. A good question is, if you look back at every election we've had since the war, in hindsight, you probably think the right answer appeared. And I think one reason was that everybody in the country is very good at judging people. It's what we do all the time. In the pub or anything else, we judge people. So when we see a group of people standing up, we have quite a good sense of whether Jeremy Corbyn or, or uh, Theresa May is somebody I can trust to make decisions. And I, think that's, and I think that, as the basis for elections, is a very sound one because people are good at judging people. I'm much more skeptical about the idea that you should extend this to ask to lots of somewhat technical questions. How do we go about things? Obviously, something as big as Brexit was so thoroughly debated, it went on for months, that people did have a view. But I, think, I don't think we would solve the problems that John Rees said. How do I create a society that's better for my children than, 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 uh, uh, than we have now? You know, John, you answer that. I don't think you're going to find the answer simply by throwing it to the people. Thank you. Let's take someone from over this side. Um, perhaps one of those down the back there. I can't. Yes, this lady here. Who, uh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. It's all yeah. yours. It's all yours. Can I? Can I speak? Yep. Yeah, my name is Alan Stroger. Uh, the speakers have touched in their exchange. The, the speakers have touched in their exchange on what I think is a key issue, and that's the floodgates Can you of speak social. Your microphone, the floodgates of social media have opened irrationality, misinformation, alternative facts. I'd like to know how the panel see the way forward in dealing with the result, which is not likely to be as factually based as one would hope. Thank you very much. Perhaps the person next to you there, I can't see. <laughs> um, just adding on to that and possibly trying to answer Mr. Lloyd's question in relation to the disconnect. Um, for me, I was very upset, Michael Mansfield, trying to address valuing the vote, and then... Sorry, 
something, and then disappearing because he didn't really address it. For me, I thought he would just, just um, education and knowledge and uh, facts and alternative facts. But also, surely we need freedom of speech to be able to debate things properly. And for me, one issue about um, disconnect is possibly political correctness, which nobody has mentioned. The issue now that the elite uh, thinks in a certain way, and if you dare to express a view that's different from that, you get clamped down. And that, I just wonder whether the panel could address that, whether that is actually the root cause of the problem. OK, this is uh, right down the back there. Sorry, I can't. Could we have a mic over here, please? Hello, Rosemary Hadfield. Um, I think one or two other people have actually raised this point, but my, my question is, are we not in this increasingly globalised world where the pace of change is very fast and in which we, we have to operate, and the spheres of influence like social media and big business are so powerful, are we not deluding ourselves that our parliament or the people have any sort of power at all in the face of uh, much bigger, more powerful influences in our world? And I wonder if we're, we're uh, rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic and actually the icebergs are all around us and are closing in. Thank you very much. Anne. <laughs> Anne, we'll take yours here. One at the front, please. Evo. Thank you very much. I'd like, Anne Dighton, I'd like to ask uh, Professor Vernon Bodnar a very specific question. Uh, with his expertise on popular sovereignty, do you think a referendum using the constituency method is an asset to popular sovereignty or a constraint upon it? Thank you, Anne. OK. Um, oh, we've got some, I can't really see. Is there somebody at the top there who wants to raise a question? I can't see anyone. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's take, uh, right down the back there, there's a hand prominently displayed. Um, my question. Can you sorry, use the sorry. mic, please? Uh, Serena Wilde. Um, my question is about the definition of democracy itself. Um, the mantra, the will of the people, has been used as an emotive tool with a kind of a threatening, a menacing energy. Now, where politicians perennially suppress truth and suggest falsehood, and there is no accountability for campaigning politicians after the event, how do we prevent our destiny being determined by the outcome of a game of poker. Thank you very much. Right, this gentleman. Oh, oh, sorry. Yes, over here. Right over. Yep, yep. <laughs> Anybody else over this side with their hands prominently? Just... Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, my name is Alan Cross, and I just want to go back to 1867 and the, the Reform Act, which extended the franchise to all males. And it was the Prime Minister, Lord Salisbury, who said, we must now educate our masters. Education has been touched on very, very slenderly over the, over the afternoon. And I would put it to the panel that his edict has not been put into place. We still need to educate our masters. Thank you very much. Right. Now, we have, I think, this gentleman here... Uh, I think if I commented, anybody here who Just tell us your name, watched please. the debate, my name's Neil Asherson, anybody who watched yesterday the, the debate on Article 50 in the House of Commons and seeing the honest agony of all those MPs who had no concept of what their proper constitutional loyalty should be, were fighting their own consciences no concept of supreme law at all, realizes that we've come to the end of a road, and the end of that road is about parliamentary sovereignty and its, its absurdity. Would you agree with me that the words spoken in this place 300 years ago scared the propertied people of England and later of the Anglo-British state so much that it accounts for the arrested development 
of British constitutionalism and the arrival of this, to me, absolutely absurd doctrine of parliamentary sovereignty, which has now really come to the end of its life. And one last thing, A.V. Dicey, who was supposed to be the great late Victorian Edwardian high priest of the doctrine of parliamentary sovereignty, panicked at the end of his life about the Leviathan, which he'd helped to anoint, so to speak, if one can anoint a Leviathan. I think one probably can. <laughs> and he said, what I now think is that in order to control the monster of executive power, which I have helped to create, in other words, uh, the dictatorship almost of a cabinet, which is now uncontrolled through the sovereignty of parliament and the structure of parliament, I believe that after all, there should be referenda, and these referenda should be negative. They should be veto. They should give the people the right of veto over decisions taken by a cabinet. All right, uh, the gentleman over here has been waiting very patiently, thank you. <coughs> well, um, we're talking about the constitutional you tell crisis. Us your name, please. Just to, we're talking about the constitutional crisis in the UK. No question mark at the end of that. I actually think the whole thing is exaggerated. I think the system works reasonably well. I agree with Vernon Bogmutter about the, the need that uh, a referenda has a place when there's a question of transferring power from one body to another, from Parliament to the EU, for example. Uh, I would add to that, I think we need referenda when we are thinking of changes in the process by which Parliament itself is selected. And I think we've moved very sharply in the direction of both those propositions. I think today, uh, uh, any proposal to change the method by which Parliament is selected will trigger a referendum as a practical matter. And secondly, we now have a law in place by which any new treaty in the European Union will be subject to referenda. So I think, in fact, much of the discussion today has, has really not produced many answers. They've produced lots and lots of rather generalized criticism. I'm pretty happy with the way things are. <laughs> You forgot to say your name. Well, that's good. There's a gentleman there. Hello, I'm Daniel Scharf. I'm the instigator of Philosopher Kings and Queens, which is a mixture of or blend of Bake Off and pub, uh, philosophy in pubs. Uh, when they debated the day, David Lammy pointed out that the people who have spoken are 27 or 28 percent of the people. And really coming to John Rees's point, a large proportion of those who didn't have a voice were the under 18s and the unborn. And I can't see any way out of having some representative democracy where parliamentarians have expert advice to represent those people who don't have the vote. All right, is there anyone left who hasn't had a chance to express their point? I can see one person over there and then we'll go back to the, and there's, one person there. Okay, so we'll take those two and we'll come back to the panel. Tell us who you Is are, it, please. Patrick Tyson Kane. Um, unlike the speaker before last, <laughs> I'm not happy with uh, how <laughs> things are. Um, but I think the, the elephant in the church, as it were, perhaps unanointed in Mr. Asherson's uh, sense, is how we get from here to anywhere else, how we change things. Does it have to be revolutionary change, the way it happened in 1649 or 1660, or is there up some way that the system can be changed? Specifically on Professor Runciman's point about our dreadful first-past-the-post system, uh, he listed some, some, some of the charge seat against it. One other, one aspect of it, unmentioned generally, is how it doesn't seem to it seems inimical to the mass election of party leaders, such as we have now, either leaders or shortlists. Um, First-past-the-post system elections are fought in the centre ground, generally. Mass election of leaders generally produces um, people from the extremes. I just wonder if he thinks that the system might implode uh, through that, and perhaps it already is in one of the two main parties. Thank you. Thank you. 
Last question. Uh, whoever's been waiting the longest. Okay. Last question, last, last comment. David Dewhurst, I was one of the organisers of the 2012 Putney debates, which Michael Mansfield mentioned. Uh, my question to the panel is that given that the parliamentary system that we've got is a kind of a stab at filtering a collective conversation of the whole of the population with its flaws, People like Hack argued that the market system was a much better, uh, somewhat weighted voting system for expressing those desires. What ideas and mechanisms do, do members of the panel see as being the optimal way of culling the collective intelligence which, say, Hayek talked about and which members of Occupy also talk about? Is it people's assemblies? Is it a layer of uh, some kind of hierarchy? Uh, modified internet. I'm interested in your answers. Thank you very much. All right, for the last few minutes, we'll return to the panel to see if there are any, amongst all those comments and questions, that you would particularly like to focus on very briefly by way of final remarks. So, shall we work from Alex, you down? You don't have to say anything if it. No, shall we? I will do. Final comment? Um, just to pick up on a couple of the questions. So I'm not sure if you can hear me. Um, should prisoners have voting rights? Uh, I would argue yes. That uh, if you believe that prison is about rehabilitation as well as about uh, denying somebody their liberty, then um, you should want to reintegrate them into society and into our democracy. Um, there are lots of questions that touch on the issue of what our democracy is and how people can be more meaningfully engaged in it. Um, somebody raised the issue of people are quite good at judging people and it kind of works. Um, I would argue that for millions of people it's not working, that many people are uh, choosing that their form of political activity is to refuse to register to vote and to uh, see voting as legitimising a system that they want nothing to do with. Um, so I think we do have to go beyond that. Um, there are a number of different deliberative participants participatory mechanisms that can be used. So, for example, in Canada, they've used citizens' assemblies to look at what the electoral system should be. Um, there are lots of different mechanisms that can be used depending on what question it is it's being considered, how many people you're trying to engage with it. But I think it's important that we, when we're thinking about popular sovereignty, we think not just in terms of referendums, but also in terms of people being able to shape their politics. Uh, and be more proactive about it. I think one of the problems that we have, are we, we've got an increasingly limited public space for deliberation, and many of the organisations and sectors, for example, the trade union movement, the voluntary sector, that often provided spaces for that collective deliberation are being restricted and being forced out of our politics. Um, so I, I think that's one of the things that we need to, we need to rem remember that obviously... Of course, voting is important to democracy, but it is also about far more than that, and so we need to look at the public space that we have for that deliberation. Thank you. Anna? Well, here, here to all that. Um, uh, you, somebody over here asked w the reasons for the disconnect. No one's mentioned capitalism, um, and I do think that there's a way in which the accumulation of, of wealth, so except uh, John did refer to it, but I, I would say we have to take that into account if we're going to look at why are people disconnected from politics um, I'm all in for, I can imagine that the, uh, if we were prepared to put the time and the resources into it, a really good system through which uh, local representative uh, uh, represent rep councillors and MPs could engage with their local populations on key issues, and this could be done across the country using a range of formats we know about. And I, I just want to make one last point, and that is that somebody mentioned future generations. We desperately need, as part of whatever new set of arrangements we have, um, some kind of commission or um, organization or a way of feeding into politics, a check on policies that are made for their impact on future generations, a commission who take in, into account and um, hold parliament to account for the impact of their decisions on future generations. It can be done, there are models in other countries and we need that as part of the settlement. Thank you, Anna. Well, and I can ask them a specific question about whether 
I think there should be a constituency count in referendums, and I think there should, because <coughs> MPs are entitled to know how their constituents voted, and it's then up to them to decide whether they would take that into account in their own votes or be, as it were, Burkean MPs, which, which some of them were. But I think we should be careful about Burke, because he was writing in the days before strongly organized political parties, and I think we should substitute for the idea of the sovereignty of Parliament the political concept of the sovereignty of the party whips. MPs aren't normally these free agents debating and discussing uh, amongst themselves. There's, there's been um, some talk about uh, um, the referendum and the facts and the referendum being inadequate and, uh, and, and deceit and so on. And I think that was true on, on both sides. But you know, I think we shouldn't be too precious about the electoral process. In 1945, Churchill famously said that the Labour government would require a Gestapo to operate itself. And in <laughs> 1992, the Labour Party said that the Conservatives, if returned, would abolish the health service. So, I mean, elections and referendums, they're not seminars at All Souls College in Oxford. They're rough and ready, and we shouldn't be too pressed about the electoral process. Finally, on prisoners and the vote, uh, I think they are, obviously prisoners should have the vote. Their punishment is that of deprivation of freedom, and people shouldn't add other punishments that they might like uh, to that specific punishment. It's the only one. I gather in Belgium you can give us an extra part of the sentence, deprivation of voting rights, but until and unless we have that, uh, people shouldn't add their own penalties to those imposed by the courts. Thank you. Akil, any final comments? So just a, a couple of things about the two two or three questions that were asked about education and the media. You know, it does seem to me that the education, um, in the, which is politically transformative, is really not uh, located in either the classrooms or in the media. Um, so for instance, the country where I'm domiciled, pretty much every major political transformation happened because of education that took place at the site of social movements. So if you take civil rights, there were professors who talked about racial equality and there were editorialists who wrote about it, but it's really only when King and Malcolm X took it to the street for an extended period that people got educated into what led to the civil rights. So I think that's an important thing to point out about where education might be located where it's politically relevant. And just a word about social media. You know, the two quick points. One is that I'll speak to, to where I am, which is in a university. The social media, which is, as David was pointing out, is a site uh, of expressiveness and expressing resentment and so on. As it happens, the youth in universities associates that uh, uh, thing that's been unleashed by social media with excessive free speech. That is because, because the interlocutors are anonymous by and large, there is, it's associated with abuse. And the youth have demanded safe spaces, you know, microaggressions being, uh, is, is entirely because they think this has gone too far. So our generation finds, you know, in the shadow of, of the McCarthyism, we, we have a very different view. But but it's because we just don't participate with the same relish as, as the youth does. And, and I just wanted to say one thing about not just social media, about the internet, which is not anxiety-inducing, but is really heartwarming. And I hadn't realized that human beings possessed a trait until this technology emerged. I really hadn't realized this, and I don't know if, if it was ever written about, but I realized after... Uh, the internet and the use of it over a, that we human beings possess a form of generosity which is cognitive generosity. If, we, if we've just eaten a delicious dish and know the recipe, we let the world know it. If, we, you know, if, if our dog has had some disease and we found a cure for it, we let the world... And I didn't know we had this generosity. It's, it's not material generosity. Somebody who's never given a penny to Oxfam will nevertheless people, let people know the little that he knows. In this. And I think that that's something I didn't know we possessed until this media emerged. Thank you. Richard, final comment? Uh, uh, yes, uh, both very brief, if I may. Um, uh, one is that um, I do think it's incredibly important that people are 
trying to defend uh, freedom of speech. But what I think is very much neglected is the question, when ought you to use your uh, right of freedom of speech, which you should retain, um, and when should you voluntarily stop it? Because it actually can stop discussion between the relevant parties instead of enhancing it, which was the original purpose. Uh, the only other thing that I think you should all be aware of is that in ancient Corinth, you were allowed to challenge the Constitution, but if you did so, you had to do so with a noose round your neck uh, so that if the vote went against you, the cord would be pulled. <laughs> Just like you to have the full range of possibilities. <laughs> Thank you, John. Brief comment. Yes, just briefly on, on the question that came up a number of times about the power of the media, about the roots of the disconnectedness of the sort of political, the political class. And, and I would say, f firstly, um, insofar as we're talking about government, it's, it's always been disconnected to a degree. I think it was said of the, one of the Wilson Labour governments that it was in government but not in power. And that's a very important uh, point to, to realise. There are very large parts of the state which are simply effectively beyond democratic control. And any serious new constitution would have to actually spread the normal democratic principles far wider through the state machine than they are, uh, than they are at the moment. And the second sense, of course, of, uh, is, is, the, is the original sense of the debate in the Putney debates. There is no democracy in the economic realm. Some of the most important things about your life whether you have a job, how hard you work, what you're paid for it, whether or not you can afford what you produce when it reappears on the shelves, are simply and intentionally and deeply embedded in the, in the political uh, ideology of the day beyond democratic control. And any outcome of any huge change would have to address that question because more than anything else, when people talk about the... the, the disassociation of the elite with, the, the, uh, with ordinary people, it's because that economic control is now even more than it was in the previous period beyond um, people's sense that they have any ability to direct or control it when they are simultaneously very directly and immediately and in their lives being deeply affected and adversely deeply affected by the exercise of that power and where they think that their political representatives are deeply influenced, if not actually controlled, by those very same forces. Thank you, John. David? Very quickly, just to pick on that last point, the question about which of the institutions or forces driving this, central banks are at the heart of this story. And that's going to be the fault line going forward. As inflation takes off, the fault line between popular democracy and central banks is going to enhance some of the tensions that we've seen. Um, we've heard a lot about education. I just want to reinforce Vernon's point, which is education is part of the problem here as well as part of the solution. The central divide revealed by these recent votes is between people who went to university and people who didn't. And we're only seeing it now because so many people go to university. It used to be concealed by the fact that no one went to university. If you educate half of the population at university, you divide the population down the middle. And so it's a, it's a problem as well as part of the solution. Um, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Shona, you have the last word. Okay, thank you. Um, is our parliamentary sovereignty an absurdity? Are we suffering from arrested development? I'm certainly no fan of Dicey. Um, and yes, I mean, he did convert to the idea of referendums later in life, but I think he did so in rather an instrumental way because um, it was in the context of home rule in Ireland, which he was very, very opposed to. And so he had a particular motivation for doing that. So I'm not sure I would really take that conversion as indicative of anything hugely, a sort of... Uh, Damascene conversion in, in his case. Uh, is our constitutional crisis exaggerated? Uh, well, I think there are a lot of people right now in Scotland, Northern Ireland, and quite a few of the 48% who would say it's not exaggerated, and they feel disenfranchised and without a vote. I think we are deeply divided in many ways. I'll leave it at that. Well, thank you very much. I, according to the programme I'm supposed to sum up, I think that would be quite impossible. And, <laughs> and I think the panellists have done a good job already in summing up. So may I thank, first of all, the audience for your very keen participation and the very 
important and interesting questions and comments you made. And I'm just sorry there's not more time. I'd particularly like to thank, however, our panelists, all of whom have given up their afternoon to come, uh, for providing us with an extremely stimulating debate. Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs>